chapter 12 has to do with how we can use our accounting information system to encourage people who work for our firm to do what we want them to do. Every firm has a cost management system. In the old days, cost information would be kept on paper or cards. Now it's mostly computerized. All firms' cost management systems are designed to do two things. Number one, they need to provide information about how much things cost for external financial reporting. But number two, we rely on the cost management system to provide useful information that will help managers make decisions about what to do going forward. And we can use some of that information as part of our management control system. That is, we can use that information to help align our manager's interests with what the firm actually wants to have happen. Here's the problem. People are naturally self-interested. That is, they would rather do what they want to do than what somebody else wants them to do. Because of that, we often have a situation called goal incongruence. That is, our employees would rather do something that they think is fun or personally beneficial rather than whatever the firm wants them to do. And that creates what's called a moral hazard, a situation in which a person's personal goals are in direct conflict with their employer's goals. And that affects the way that people make decisions. Making decisions is one of the key functions of management. In the olden days, when firms were very small, in fact, most firms could take place in a single room, it was very easy to see who was working hard and who was goofing off because everybody was in plain view. Most firms now are decentralized. They may be decentralized physically, that is, the corporate offices and various management functions and various manufacturing functions may be in different locations. They may also be decentralized in terms of their decision-making structure. Generally speaking, there's a superior, a boss, or principal who delegates assignments, and there are subordinates or agents who carry out those duties. Any time you have a principal and agents, you create a principal-agent relationship. That is, the boss is asking subordinates to do things on the boss's behalf, and that creates an agency issue. The reason that this is a problem is because the agent may choose to pursue his or her agenda at the expense of what the boss wants. Management control systems are designed to decrease that possibility. So if we can acquire information about 
what the agent actually chooses to do, then we don't have to stand there and watch them all day to make sure that they do the right thing. In addition, if we want to incentivize actions that we deem important, we can use our accounting information system data as part of our contracts with our managers. So let's think about this principal-agent relationship. Conventional wisdom says that stockholders are the principals of the firm, that is, they are the owners, but they have agents. They have asked these agents to turn their money that they've invested in the firm into more money. The direct agents of the stockholders would be the firm's board of directors. They're charged with hiring top management and setting the strategic direction of the firm. But they don't do those things themselves. The board of directors has agents too. That would be the firm's CEO. The firm's CEO in turn has agents the firm's vice presidents, each of whom has a specific responsibility. So, for example, what about the VP of Finance? That vice president's agent would be the firm's treasurer and the firm's controller, one of whom might be you or might be your boss. If it's your boss, then their agent would be you. You, in fact, have agents too. Anytime you ask your dentist, your stockbroker, your travel agent to do something for you, then they are acting as your agent. So, business and the world in general is really a web of principle agent relationships. There are a number of reasons that firms choose to decentralize. Obviously, they can have more specific local knowledge, they can respond to problems more quickly, uh, it means that top management can delegate responsibilities rather than doing everything themselves, it means that many problems are broken up into smaller, more manageable pieces, and having a decentralized organization creates a training ground for future upper-level managers. However, it also has some disadvantages. A number one, dysfunctional decision-making, mostly based on agency problems. Another issue is that there's always a certain amount of duplication in a decentralized organization because each component of the organization needs maintenance, record keeping, uh, snow removal from the driveways, all of the things that go with having an organization that is not all located in one room. Finally, decentralized organizations often have incomplete information, either information that is deliberately incomplete because somebody has an agenda, or simply the fact that it takes time for information to flow from one component of the organization to another. Management control systems are designed to reduce the agency problem by aligning the agent's actions with what the firm wants. What does the firm want? 
that depends on the firm's strategy. So a firm that is trying to grow or a firm that is trying to refocus on its core competencies or a firm that's trying to innovate or a firm that is reaching the end of its life cycle, they would all have different strategies and look for different things within the management control system. In addition, what the firm wants depends on its environment. That would include its regulatory environment and what is natural and normal for this firm or its industry. Firms that design good management control systems are often rewarded with higher share price and better ability to achieve their goals. So let's look a little bit more at what we want from our management control system. The first thing we need to do is think about who within our organization makes specific decisions. Once we've decided who's in charge of making the decision, then we have to think how do we measure the efficacy of that decision. We can use financial measures like net sales or divisional income. We can also use non-financial measures like customer satisfaction or defect rates or delivery times. Obviously, the measures that we choose are going to depend on the kinds of decisions that we are evaluating. Then we need to think about the cookie. What is it that we're going to give managers for making particular decisions? We can reward our managers explicitly with money either in the form of higher salaries or cash bonuses or we could use stock and stock options. Those are commonly used in order to encourage managers to make decisions that shareholders would appreciate or perquisites like a bigger office or keys to the executive washroom. We can also reward managers implicitly. That is telling people they did a good job, promoting them to higher levels of responsibility. And the whole point of this game is to create a situation in which managers will do the very thing that we would want them to do anyway because now it is not just in the firm's interest, it's in their interest too.